You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Hello and welcome to number three uh, in a series called the COVID Practitioner Challenge. I'm John Scott and this is an INCJ podcast and YouTube. COVID-19 is presenting a unique challenge to frontline services, not just in the health and social sectors, but in criminal justice too. At INCJ, we wanted to find out how leaders and practitioners internationally were handling the issues around COVID-19. So we've started a conversation with practitioners to ask about their experience of the crisis. Our hope is that sharing answers will help find solutions and fresh ideas. If you want to follow the series, you'll find it on our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or on Twitter at INTCJ Network. I got that wrong, so I'll try it again at INTCJ Network. So let me introduce Claudia Matsukato, who is a, an associate professor of criminal law at the Catholic University in Milano. That's in Italy, and she is a restorative justice practitioner. Claudia, welcome. Now, tell us where you're based, and are you working at home this morning? Well, good morning to to you, John, and to everyone. I'm based in Milano. I am Mm -hmm. at the university facility in my room at the Department of Legal Sciences. Now, tell us about your current job. I am Associate Professor of Criminal Law, as you said, and I'm engaged in both teaching uh, and research. And I teach criminal law and restorative justice also to international students. So I have two courses uh, as restorative justice is concerned. One is Italian taught and the other one is English taught, although my English is not so fluent, as you will see. <laughs> well, your English is a great deal better than my Italian. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you enjoy teaching or do you enjoy writing most? Well, I enjoy studying, writing and teaching um, all the same. I love the relationship with students. And I love the relationship that books, articles are capable of creating too. So reaching out to other people and having influence, I guess. Yes, and uh, discoveries. Uh, Every encounter is a discovery. Every encounter lets the unexpected emerge. And I am fascinated by the richness of people, of people's stories and people's minds. And and so I love being with people. Mm. Now, do you have any other roles apart from in the university? Well, I have some service uh, um, in commissions where uh, we have dialogues with students uh, to uh, do some troubleshooting uh, to improve our teaching and our um, organization in the university. At present, I am also working in one of the commissions for our centenary because my university is celebrating its centenary. And so, uh, and I am presently involved in a fascinating EU funded project with the European Forum for Restorative Justice and KU Leuven and other universities and the respective schools for the judiciary which is um, a project to train the judiciary in the field of restorative justice. It is called re-justice. Okay, we'll perhaps find out more about that in a moment. But tell me, how did you get into mediation and restorative justice? Well, this is a very personal story that I would love to share. Um, I had the chance, the luck, to have... uh, 
teachers at the universities that were masters as well. And uh, they brought me, uh, and together with other students, I was a law student back then, it was 1991, and we spent a whole week in one of Italy, Italy's uh, prisons facility in a Tuscany island. It is still a prison facility. And we stayed there for a whole week, night and day, of course. And um, I met people who were serving their sentences and even life sentences. And I was so shocked by the fact that it was like their lives were fixed, stopped at the moment of the crime. And when this incredible week finished, um, I happened to listen to an interview to one of uh, the victims of terrorism, uh, family members of a victim of Italian terrorism. And also she was uh, like her story was stopped at the moment of the crime. So I asked my uh, philosophy of law professor and my criminal law professor um, to support me in writing my dissertation, my final dissertation of, on the encounter of victims and offenders. And this is how I discovered what was called just victim of mediation back then, and then slowly, slowly became to be restorative justice. So this was my encounter with um, restorative justice. And then so, I dedicated my life to it. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So you're, you're a lawyer and you talked a lot about how important relationships are, but lots of lawyers uh, are dominated by that but by their head and <laughs> see legal challenges as about disputes over statutes and winning and losing so why are you different uh, well this is a wonderful question um i well in fact i do recognize that i may be different from some lawyers but on the other hand um, criminal law deals with harms, sufferings, offenses, and the legal acknowledgement that something is wrong because it can harm people. And actually, um, the law is one of the most profound human experiences. If uh, we didn't live with others, we wouldn't need the law. We need the law because we are connected to others. And so actually the law itself can be seen more as rules of conduct, indications for behavior. And inside this, there is a lot that deals with relationships. So my effort, also my academic effort, is to study in criminal law how criminal law is not just punishment and actually it should the less and less be linked with punishments, but it is ways to help people behave properly in order not to harm others. So the rule of conduct and compliance with the rule of conduct is an essential part of criminal law in a democratic setting. Um, law is not a command. Law is not coercion in a democracy. Law is a way to help people behave respectfully towards one another. So law is a sort of way to present relationships, even when people do not know each other, even when people do not like each other, even when people do not love each other. So law is full of humanity. It's not just um, something abstract. 
it's so, so, so uh, rooted in human life. Now, let's hold with that very profound s summary of the law. <laughs> and we are going to now explore some very hard realities because it also affects death. Mm -hmm. And you uh, are living in the center of Milano. And very sadly, Northern Italy was the first part of Europe to be hit by the COVID-19 virus. And uh, in early 2020, we had almost no knowledge of the impact of the virus and the horror of its spread was very, very, very difficult for you and your neighbors and your communities in Northern Italy. Now, um, we're going to be looking at the impact of the law and maybe the role of mediation later in this interview. But let's look at COVID-19 and maybe think about what it was like to be in the middle of the pandemic and its outbreak uh, through your story. So can I take you back to February, March 2020? And I think it was quite a difficult time in your personal life. So I'm conscious that uh, we need to take this fairly gently. So tell us where you were when you first heard about this strange uh, virus, this uh, outbreak of COVID-19. Where were you, Claudia? Well, actually, I was in Central America. I was in El Salvador uh, for a project on uh, prevention of juvenile delinquency funded by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Agency for the Development, Human Development. And I was working in this rural, rural area in El Salvador in schools for um, helping schools draft school regulations uh, in order not to have violence in schools. It's a project on Escuelas Libre de Violencia. Uh, and actually what happened was that my father suddenly died and it was the very first day of the outbreak of the pandemic. My father didn't die of COVID, uh, so I, I came back to Italy on an airplane and, of course, I was not wearing any mask. I was not, um, uh, I was not following any of the regulations that we are now used to because back then there was no regulation. Actually, in um, the airport in San Salvador, the officer, officials there, they were wearing masks, but it was kind of odd. Also, I stepped, I stopped, I flew over to Madrid and then to Milano, and I was with thousands of people. No one were, was following the um, this regulation, and it sounded also odd, and it seemed that to be afraid of this was like to like not be brave, not be strong. So, well, but what happened was that I faced the pandemic because um, we couldn't have a funeral with uh, friends and family for my father. It was just seven of us my uh, brother, my sister, my husband, um, uh, my brother's uh, wife and our two nephews. That was all. And also my father could not be buried because um, by chance my whole family is buried in the very place where there was the outbreak in Casal Pusterlengu, which is a village uh, in the southern part of Lombardy. And no one could step into that village. It, there were the military all around the village. So uh, we could bury my father only one month later. But actually, 
this that sounded so odd and at the beginning it sounded so exaggerated to us why couldn't we have our friends and family other relatives at my father's funeral it sounded so too much and instead well it was nothing compared to what was about to happen and as you said lombardy and especially some places in Lombardy, like the town of Ber Ber Bergamo, which is northern of Milano, closer to the mountains. And it is a town of people that in Italy are recognized and acknowledged to be tough guys, you know, those who work hard, who are afraid of nothing, who are very, very... Um, made strong by, um, by their story, their lives. And that was a place where there were so many, many deaths because of COVID. Actually, uh, statistics said that in February, March, um, it was the highest number in death in the whole world compared to the population. And what happened was that um, people were cremated without their family members even knowing it. Um, people could not accompany their family members to hospitals. So they waved goodbye to their family members, never saw them again, and had a military uh, member of the army um, uh, giving the ashes back like two, three weeks after. We had the army involved in the dealing of corpses. And this is unbelievable. And um, the obituaries in the local newspaper were so many that at first it was like three pages, then it became like 20, 25 pages of obituaries in the newspapers, the local newspapers, they couldn't even publish it. So what they did, they set up a huge screen in the middle of the town of Bergamo with the names and photographs of the dead. <laughs> and, and I'm talking about again, a town of tough people, not emotional ones. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of friends there, even including my lovely friends from the Restorative Justice Service in Bergamo. They tell us that they lost um, the parisher and uh, the mayor in the same day, not in Bergamo, but in the surrounding smaller towns. Um, it, it was incredible, incredible. Now, how did you experience it yourself and your husband? Did you feel that you had to retreat into your, uh, your home and did you feel locked up? We were locked up. We had regulations and Lombardy used the strictest ones. We were actually like prisoners in our homes. Uh, we could go outside only out of necessity and we could walk just to move a bit within 200 meters from our home. Uh, and this was for the whole of Italy and at, at one stage and for long yes and <laughs> um, it was a terrible experience terrible experience and incredibly it was like uh, it, last year was a beautiful springtime the sun was always out and it's a lot of us said that it seemed we never had such a beautiful spring <laughs> before. So it was even more painful to be locked up. And, but 
we were confused um, and we were really uh, touched by what was happening, all of us. What happened to your work at the university, Claudia? Well, uh, since the very day my father died, which coincides with the outbreak. So I came back from El Salvador. On the next Monday, I should have had my classes and my classes were put off. Uh, at the beginning, we thought this was going not to last so long. So simply uh, classes were put off and we said we are going to do them later on in May. At the end of the semester, we will have an extra week of classes. Then we realized that this was not going to be the case. So we started having online classes. And since in the second semester, I teach the English taught course with international students, uh, we were in these strange situations of having classes with students that sometimes um, the majority of cases had gone back to their own countries. And we had to have a poll to um, fix the schedule of classes because they were connected from the five continents and which was both fascinating and terrible at the meantime and I never ever ever met these students in person never and I miss this so much and and I loved the way students were trying to be committed anyway and we're reaching out to us to in search for connections, relationships. Um, they didn't want to be left alone. And so we tried to, um, to do as much as we could. Our Dean, who is a lovely person, the Dean of my faculty of political and social sciences, he was writing emails to each one of us as uh, teachers and also to students to, to, to invite us all to stay connected, to stay close, to have as much as uh, relationships, even online ones, as we could have, and to share fears, uh, sorrows, and so on. And, well, this did happen. I, have, I really love, I must say, my students of last year, because it was like a special relationship against all odds. Okay. I want to turn attention a little now towards your work as a mediator, um, because your uh, approach to restorative justice has been applied to working with the victims and former members of armed groups. And my understanding, Claudia, is that this has been over many years. And I think that this very traumatized time will have had an impact on that work, both on the victims and of the, the armed group members themselves. So if you're able to, without breaching confidences, obviously, it would be fascinating perhaps to hear about their experience of the pandemic as well so could you talk us into that please yes well i must say first that yes we have been going on for a long time working uh, with restorative dialogues with these people and um this is a necessary uh introduction because these people now they know each other very well, uh, both victims, family members, and former members of armed groups, uh, are armed groups in Italy, active in Italy. And so what happened was that we had online meetings, but incredibly, and it's and so beautifully, um, victims and former members helped each other so much. Uh, during these lockdowns, <laughs> they were so strongly and closely connected to one another. Uh, they informed each other about uh, 
everyone's health, about the necessity of uh, each other, proposing to help each other. And this for us, uh, mediators, facilitators, it's me, Guido Bertania and Adolfo Ceretti, the three facilitators of this uh, 15 year long uh, restorative experience. It was like uh, a proof and an evidence of the strength uh, of the links, the connections and the relationships. I may even say, I dare say the friendship that has been built thanks to restorative justice among these so uh, different people. Um, perhaps, perhaps we could ex explore that a little more. So um, are the people that were in the armed groups, are they now in the community or are they still in prison? They are all in the community by now. Some okay. of them so have served uh, like nearly 40 years in prison um, and were released on parole but they are all in the community now. But of course they have experience of really high security imprisonment. Yes. And I think our listeners will be interested to know if their, their experience of genuine lockdown was able to translate into their understanding of um, not real imprisonment, but the constraints on freedom that the victims would be experiencing? Well, uh, one, uh, uh, one anecdote that I can mention is that uh, during some of these online meetings, uh, we facilitators and the victims, we were taught how to walk for miles <laughs> in one room <laughs> because the people had, who had had a long experience of imprisonment, of course, they, had, they needed to exercise in very small places. And so they taught us how to walk along the line. So you take the room and you start going through to and fro in the small room you have in a small place you're allowed to have um, tracing lines <laughs> one next to the other and you can walk for kilometers by this so this was an example but I must say that um, another very interesting experience we had is how these people are uh, caref careful and caring for life and so they were really, really like recommending, especially to the victims, to take care, to be careful, to protect themselves because their life is important uh, for them who put life at risk. <laughs> it is so interesting. This is again, the rule of conduct. Once through restorative justice, Someone who has murdered, killed someone else, experiences the impact of killing on the family members of the victim. It's like they want to protect life from that moment onwards. That is a very deep message, isn't it? Because yeah. uh, I, I guess... Uh, through the pandemic where people have died before their time, all of us have had this sense of how fragile life is. But you're saying that in the mediation restorative justice process, at the very, very extreme end of that, working with uh, some people would call them armed terrorists, but armed groups that have, have taken life, in that process, maybe over many years, they've come to experience how life can be precious and maybe the, the awfulness of their previous crime. Yes, exactly. Yes. And um, I know no one who cares 
for the victims more than the former offenders who were involved in this restorative dialogues. I can provide an example. Uh, one of the former members of armed group, groups um, always, always uh, goes and collect one of the victims um, and brings this victim to the meetings by driving him, this victim, no matter where the meeting takes place, even if this uh, implies having to drive life for 600 kilometers. This person always, always does this as a continuous permanent act of reparation and of care. And, and on the other side, to sit in a car with the person who has taken lives is an act of trust, huge act of trust. And sometimes in this group, which is a very lively group, and we also have, if the, this doesn't sound odd, we have also fun together. We are well together. We sometimes laugh saying, imagine if the uh, police stop a car just for a normal uh, control and it is a former member of an armed group and one victim going uh, together on the highway, chatting around, stopping to have a coffee or uh, but this is restorative justice that makes life possible again by living to, together again, no matter what has happened before. That's a really powerful picture that people can have in their minds about how mediation can, can work. Mm -hmm. So let, let's, let's hold that picture because I want us to come back to Milano. And we uh, left talking about um, the pandemic and we're going to come back to the horrors of the pandemic as it swept through the towns and villages of uh, Northern Italy. And there were people devastated, families left grieving of a of just a knock on the door and a soldier turning up with uh, the ashes of someone who was there, either a father or a mother or sister or, or, or brother or whatever. And the impact on the hospitals, on the medical staff, on communities must have been absolutely dreadful. So I want to ask a little more about what was the reaction of communities of ordinary people to these horrors uh, and as it's now uh, well over a year since that all began we'll talk about wh what their f what feelings are like in those communities now but first of all let's talk about the initial impact how what was the experience like for ordinary people in the towns and villages well, it was dreadful, as you said, and it was confusing. And uh, it was and still is similar, very similar to a collective trauma. Um, like after a disaster. But um, what has uh, slowly um, become is that people's per perception is um, that this is not just a natural disaster, but it can also be somehow a man-made disaster. And so slowly but steadily and increasingly, there was and there is a quest for um, uh, responsibility, liability, and in these terms, also justice, to know what has exactly 
uh, produced this situation, uh, knowing the, the need to know the truth, what has happened, uh, how it was dealt, if there have been mistakes, why in case there have been mistakes, and what can be done and must be done in order for mistakes not to happen again. So there is like a social demand uh, in terms of um, truth, justice, non-reoccurrence. And for someone like me who studies criminal justice, this is exactly the same terms we uh, step into when we study work on transitional justice settings. Um, but, do you, but, do you, but, but do you think that uh, ordinary people are angry and are going to try to use criminal justice solutions to f get answers for their grief? Well, this is not what I think. This is what is happening. <laughs> because okay. we in Italy, and especially in Lombardy, and especially in Milano and Bergamo, we have seen the, um, the setting up of victims' organizations, COVID victims' organization. And in Bergamo, this association of family members of people who died because of COVID proposed to crime report the death of their beloved ones as a crime out of negligence, maybe even recklessness sometimes, they think. And um, so they proposed a crime reporting day gathering dozens of families in the prosecutor's office in Bergamo, placing this crime report uh, for the avoidable death of their, what they claim was the avoidable death of their beloved ones. There are criminal in investigations going on that do not deal with medical doctors as the first responders, because of course they did their best. It's not there that the negligence, probably the claim for negligence is probably placed. It's more on the general organization of uh, how to deal with the pandemic and the situation. So actually criminal investigations are um, involving institutions, even so, at the highest levels, investigations, not by now, it's not suspect or accusation, or at least it's not yet. But we have been crime reports. We have been seeing uh, family members setting up victims association. And this, of course, poses a whole lot of questions to legal scholars, practitioners, uh, practitioners, and so forth. Now, this is really hard, is it not? Because I want to ask, is the language correct? You know, is the language of victim, investigation, allegations of negligence, is the language right? But that's my first question. The second is, is the criminal justice system the right place to go? So talk to me about language first and then about whether the criminal justice system is the right place. Well, um, as far as language, um, I am in, I live, I'm a citizen of the European Union. So I will apply the Victims Directive. And the Victims Directive says that uh, victims should be recognized, uh, treated in a professional, unbiased, fair manner um, with an individual assessment 
of their protection needs in terms of protection from repeat victimization and secondary victimization. And for them all, the Victims Directive at Recital 19 states that someone should be recognized as a victim regardless the suspect person is identified, apprehended, prosecuted, or convicted. So this is a challenge. What does it mean to have all these deaths, to have people saying, I am a victim, going to the court, placing uh, uh, a crime report, uh, saying, well, you have to do a thorough investigation to ascertain uh, whether these deaths occurred out of negligence. And this, I go to the second part of your question. What will happen in the criminal justice system with these investigations? Well, this is a big issue because criminal justice, of course, has to stick to fundamental safeguards. And one of these is that someone can be convicted only if his, her responsibility, criminal liability is proved beyond any reasonable doubt in terms of intent, in the, in the cases where intent, of course, this is not the case, we hope so. Uh, or negligence or recklessness and so forth. So to reach a proof beyond any reasonable doubt is very unlikely in a situation like this, even if, and I don't know, I'm not a prosecutor, I'm not a judge, so I don't, ho I don't have the documents stemming from this investigation. So I cannot say that, but um, if in case negligence has occurred, it will be impossible to prove it, except maybe for gross negligence cases. So the fear I have is that to bring this quest for justice inside criminal justice, and punitive criminal justice, that because of this punitiveness um, entails safeguards and also brings about defensiveness. This will leave uh, those who uh, present themselves as victims with no responses and also will not help a truth seeking and truth telling because the suspect and the accused will defend themselves and they are entitled the constitutional right not to tell the truth. Uh, this is a constitutional right in Italy. So an accused person is not compelled to say the truth. They can remain silent, but they he can even hide the truth. An accused person is entitled this right among the decision on how to defend himself or herself. So maybe we need to put aside punitiveness and bring about something else which is restorative. <laughs> and it is like a full disclosure and a common participatory effort to learn um, from what has happened in order not to have it occur again, together with other initiatives that again, uh, transitional justice settings teach us and tell us work like memorialization. We have had many initiatives also including the president of the Republic. We had concerts for the victims in Bergamo uh, with music by Donizetti, who is from Bergamo. Uh, we've had um, 
memorial ceremonies. Uh, my colleagues in Bergamo, uh, my victim offender mediators and facilitators from the restorative justice office in Bergamo, they are working with the population there to have this uh, common memories. And also art is being used. Uh, there is a famous art gallery in Bergo, Bergamo, which is, which is working uh, with arts and arts, arts also created by the people from the town of, town of Bergamo who have been affected in order to uh, let the memory be alive. And, but then yes, there is some rage and this rage goes in the only pla place where those who claim and complain can bring it, that is courts. But maybe. Okay, so all this anger, your belief, I think, is that restorative justice processes specifically has much to offer. Would you have any concrete recommendations to make to your community that would avoid going down the criminal litigation route? Well, um, my hope, and I am trying together with other people also from the European Forum for Restorative Justice, my hope with these people is to maybe in the near future propose something like a truth commission. Um, so to set aside criminal responsibility, punishments, and open up a common dialogue with institutions, with peoples, with, with affected communities, with um, victim, COVID survivors and COVID victims, family members, in order to really sort of um, uh, have a look in depth to what has happened, why it happened, and how it can be prevented with a better organization in the future. And this also brings about a step forward, I think, in the development of restorative justice. Uh, we always say that restorative justice is forward looking. And it is true because it deals with what people are going to do next after the criminal offense, after the injustice, the wrongdoing. But um, it is always a, especially interpersonal. So among individuals or communities as um, collective, uh, as collecting in the gathering individuals. Here we could use restorative justice to set up a better organizational system in the future. And actually we are working with a colleague who is a scientist of organizations, um, Maurizio Catino, and um, this links restorative justice to um, organizational resilience. So how complex organization can become more resilient by learning from their mistakes. If we punish mistakes, mistakes will not help us improve. If we use restorative justice to learn from our mistakes, then the reparation of what went wrong will be the form of justice that we can offer also to communities, to victims, even if those mistakes have a criminal relevance. Because we can unfortunately not resuscitate those who are dead. We can prevent other people from dying. And this is part of a clever, I think, clever idea of justice because we cannot a change. little like in yeah. no no you got yes it's a, yes a, a little like in south africa where they had a truth and reconciliation process you couldn't have reconciliation 
without the truth coming out. Uh, the two things had to go side by side. Precisely. Um, and the case you are mentioning is a case that used individual amnesty. So they, they left outside this process, punishment, in order to gain truth. Uh, so uh, this is interesting. And interestingly, in South Africa, they also had institutional hearings. So not just the individual hearings with individual victims, individual perpetrators uh, asking for amnesty, but they also had like moments in which they tried to look at uh, what has happened from a more institutional, organizational point of view. Yes, I think there's a real dilemma here, isn't there, in justice terms, because what if there are crimes to be found out? If there was corruption, for example, uh, and if there was neglect. So always in this mix, there is the problem of uh, people not being able to be resurrected. And the anger within the community has to be somehow uh, mediated. And equally, the, the sort of truth needs to find out exactly what happened. Yes, but justice can also be in terms of uh, tangible and non-tangible reparations. And also in terms of seeing uh, that things change for the future. We cannot change the past, but we can change the future. And non-recurrence is a key concept here. That's, that's beautifully put. I want to ask you, as you've been right in the center of this trauma, uh, about how you've reflected as a person through this. Has anything made you rethink your approach to work? Mm. Yes, meaning that uh, I realized how uh, humans are made for hugging, <laughs> touching, experiencing, um, being together, um, not just living in this sort of in vitro life, uh, facing a computer. So uh, the lack of all this is making me feel uh, that this is more precious and I can't wait to go back at what was before, improving what was before, because before was not perfect, but um, we have to make a good use of this worldwide crisis. We have to learn from it. Otherwise, we will miss an opportunity. I'm afraid we will use computers even more, and this we won't go back to before. Uh, but we must be aware of the risks of not having this fully human experience that is made of all the senses and not just a voice in sight. <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm also conscious that we started by lockdown happening exactly the same, same time as you lost your father. And have you had time to sort of catch up with that sense of grief and loss as well? Not really. It's like uh, it's the end of that world was uh, the end of my personal world. My father was my last parent, living parent. Um, and uh, yes, it's like uh, that 21st February, 2020, it's uh, a big personal change in company with the whole world. So I feel, um, but I feel connected to the world because of this. So what has happened in my little personal life and in the world is on the same date. And it's a turning point, personal and worldwide. Well, that, that co connectivity comes, comes 
through almost everything you say. So thanks very much for that. Now, I'm conscious that I've asked you loads of questions and put you on the spot, and it only seems fair for you to throw a question at me. So do you have a, a, a killer question for me, Claudia? Well, I don't want to kill you. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a relief. <laughs> But uh, I would love to know what you think about this idea of using restorative justice to improve organizations and to respond to the quest for justice of people within this pandemic? Um, well, I'll try the two minute answer rather than the two hour one, okay? <laughs> um, I think that people want justice. They also want answers. And um, I am really clear that because this is the first time in 101 years there's been a worldwide pandemic, tackling this in each country is going to be very different. But the principles of having an open investigation and all institutions being honest about where there is learning to be done has got to be right. And um, being driven by anger has got to be wrong. So if you can have uh, a model which says, let's talk and listen and learn, and for that to be driven by justice and I'm going to use the word reconcili re reconciliation or, or justice and reparation or justice and mediation. That has got to be right. And my feeling, Claudia, is that Italy is ahead of the rest of the world because all around the world there are communities riven and broken by this pandemic. And we've got to learn how to handle that anger and that pain. And criminal justice knows a lot about getting people together to look at very, very painful issues about loss. And I've got a picture in my head of the two men driving 600 kilometers, one of whom was a killer and the other of whom lost a relative, and they were able to do that. Now, if that can happen through mediation, Surely the same processes in macro terms can bring communities back together again. So my answer is, let's use proper processes rather than angry processes. So uh, I, think, I think my answer is yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Now I'm wanting to finish, give you the last words really, and whether you've got any COVID-19 advice for restorative justice workers out there around the world, Claudia? What would you say to your colleagues out there? Well, that we have um, in our hands um, a precious uh, tool, a precious proposal, and uh, that we should uh, use it wisely in terms of service for the, all those who would like um, to begin the unexpected path of going towards the difficult others, the unexpected difficult others. And so we should make a good use of this tool to serve a good use of this uh, worldwide crisis. Thank you so much. And on that note, I think we're going to have to sign off. Uh, I imagine our listeners would want to listen to you for another hour, but uh, we, we're going to stop now. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Uh, we've called this a series a COVID uh, practitioner challenge, but I think today this has been a COVID justice challenge. And I'm hoping that you will stay safe and also hoping that you can join us next time. Uh, goodbye, everybody. And thank you, Claudia, Claudia.
very, very much. Please remember that our podcasts are available on your normal provider under the INCJ podcast label. And uh, uh, Claudia, Claudia has written an article. It's on the uh, European Forum for Restorative Justice website. And uh, she will be very pleased if you go there to read it. I thought it was absolutely excellent. It was called uh, COVID-19 Wounds or healed COVID-19 wounds, we need Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I think you would very much benefit by reading that. So it's goodbye from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, John. You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, Conversations about International Criminal Justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.